So a couple months back, I saw this chart someone made on Reddit. Essentially, this user categorized many roguelike games as requiring more skill or luck. I'm a big fan of roguelike games, so I thought might as well do one too. However, before I go any further, I should outline how I'm going to evaluate the games I'm going to raid. Now, I'm not a hardcore gamer or anything, so I'm only going to raid 8 roguelikes that I have personally played. Also, I'm aware that for some of these games, you really have to play for almost hundreds of hours to fully understand them. Now, obviously, I don't have hundreds of hours on all of these games. That's just not very feasible now. Also, this video is not a review on any games. It's just an idea that I thought of, and I thought it would be pretty fun to make. But before I go any further, according to YouTube statistics, 100% of the viewers that watch my videos are subscribed to me. Thank you. Alright, let's begin. So I'm going to change up the original rating scheme slightly. Now, since skill and luck are not mutually exclusive things, aka a game can require both skill and luck, I'm going to use a scale of 1 through 10 for both of these two factors. A 1 in skill means anyone can pick it up and have fun, and a 10 means the game is Dark Souls. Now, I'm going to need to clarify this next bit, because I know there will be a lot of confusion. I'm defining luck as something more akin to randomness or variability. Not a way to downplay a player's abilities to play the game. In other words, just because if I give a high luck rating to a game, it's not a bad thing. In fact, it's a good thing. See, a defining feature of the roguelike genre is that no two runs will be identical. It's how your experience as a player can be different even though you're playing the same game over and over again. And with that, a luck rating of 1 means that runs will be very similar to each other, and a 10 means you might as well be playing a different game after each run altogether. However, here is another twist. In order to create drama and tension, I cannot give the same skill or luck rating to two different games, so every single game will have a different rating to keep things interesting. And I like it when things are interesting. Like I said, I'm not a hardcore gamer or anything, so feel free to give your own opinions in the comments. But let's be real here, the majority of comments on this video would just be people justifying how their favorite roguelike requires the most amount of skill. Without further ado, let's get started. So me and Binding of Isaac go all the way back. I actually first played the Wrath of the Lamb DLC when I was in elementary school, which I believe was all the way back in 2012. There's a reason why this game is so influential in the roguelike industry. Up until Repentance, the latest DLC, it's gone through continuous variations and improvements. That's why it's one of the most well-known games in the genre. I actually have more hours in Isaac than Dead Cells, and I'm still working on the tainted characters. A big part of what makes Binding of Isaac fun is its huge pool of items. With hundreds of possible combinations, you can literally have unlimited possibilities in a run. However, Binding of Isaac is one of the few roguelikes I know that actually have items that can make your run worse. In fact, a select few in the game can just instantly kill your run altogether. Now, I have to admit, there's definitely skill involved when it comes to playing this game, such as not taking red health damage on the second floor and it guarantees you a devil deal. Some players are so good they can essentially have over 100 win streak while playing as Eden. However, one cannot deny that luck also plays a factor. Since there is a hidden rarity system in item pools, some runs will actually be significantly easier than others. It's because of this rarity system that keeps things interesting. You never know when you're gonna end up with a mom's knife or a cursed eye. Now given that the bulk of the outcomes of runs depend on what items you get, you don't really have that much control when it comes to builds. However, there is enough meaningful decision making that can impact your run, so not everything in your game is determined by randomness. Unless you're playing Tainted Lost, of course, in that case your run is pretty much completely down to chance. And while I understand that the lack of item descriptions is part of the old school gaming feel, but these days you really want players to know what you're picking up, and honestly I think this is just kind of like a quality of life improvement that the game needs. Thankfully there are mods that do that. Memorizing the functions of the hundreds of items in the game does not make you skilled at it. It just means you should probably go outside. I didn't ask to be telefragged by Delirium, and I certainly did not ask for the donation machine to jam on a third penny. But you know, that's on me and my skill issue. So I give Binding of Isaac a luck rating of 6 and a skill rating of 4. Slay the Spire is known to be the most influential card roguelike to hit the genre. With four different classes and hundreds of cards, there are a lot of ways to mix and match your way to victory. 
Once you beat the game, there are modifiers known as Ascensions that can further add difficulty to your runs until you've stacked all the way to Ascension 20. I've won with all characters at least once, this includes going to the final ending, and I've done some Ascension gameplay as well. So far, Ironclad is my favorite class to play. However, here is where Slay the Spire differs itself quite drastically from the other games on this list. There is no mechanical gameplay. The majority of your skills improve upon gaining knowledge on the cards and see how each of them interact with another. And that's totally fine. In fact, there are actually different strategies for different Ascension levels. For example, it's actually better to have a deck with more cards on higher Ascensions to minimize your chances of drawing into Ascender's Bane. So there is a degree of complexity when it comes to deck building. But like I said, the game lacks mechanical gameplay. In any of the other games on this list, if you theoretically go to the final boss with nothing but the starter equipment, it's technically possible to win. I'm looking at Hades, Dead Cells, Gungeon to name a few of them. But in Slay the Spire, you have a 0% chance of winning if you go to the third boss with the starting cards. You will absolutely get annihilated. Just like Binding of Isaac, there is rarity when it comes to cards, so no two runs will contain the same deck. Some aren't good at all, and some single-handedly win you the run. If you get Corruption as Ironclad, then you basically just won. However, there is an aspect that can cause you to lose the run no matter what. That comes from not being able to pick which boss you fight. Now, this isn't bad on earlier bosses, but the third level boss specifically differs from each other drastically. For example, if you get a deck that abuses an infinite combo, and you find out that you're going to fight a boss that limits how many cards you can play in a row, then you're going to lose that run. Now, you didn't choose to fight this boss, so losing in this manner after discovering an interesting combo just feels kind of bad. Overall though, Slay the Spire is still a pretty enjoyable game. I give Slay the Spire a luck rating of 8 and a skill rating of 3. Enter the Gungeon is a twin-stick shooter, full of hell roguelike, with an emphasis on dodge rolling. Now, this is probably one of the few roguelikes where luck matters just as much as skill. There is a tier system when it comes to item quality in chests, but it's balanced in a way that really doesn't matter what items you get. As far as I know, none of the S tier items can really give you a free win. For example, the Yari Launcher is an exceptional boss killing weapon, but it has really low ammo. You'll probably run out entirely after one boss fight. On the other hand, although the KC Baseball Bat is a D tier item, it is extremely overpowered. Also, the game barely gives you any resources in the late game, and you must pick up the item drops in the same room you found it in, otherwise the resource rat takes it. This makes ammo and resource management really important. Unlike Binding of Isaac, every item and gun are pretty much guaranteed to be helpful. There's almost never instances where you choose not to take an item. Since you can swap out guns at any time, it really tests your abilities to think on your feet and makes you choose the best combinations for each encounter. And for that reason, I think Enter the Gungeon has one of the highest skill ceilings out of any roguelike. I give Gungeon a luck rating of 4 and a skill rating of 9. Risk of Rain 2 is a third-person looter shooter roguelike with a very unique timer mechanic. Now, this game also has a tier system when it comes to item drops, but honestly, this item rarity system has probably one of the highest discrepancies between a rare item and a non-rare item. See, in order to make it far in your runs, the best builds out there does not just have damage dealing items, but also a combination of mobility and defense upgrades. So the game is never really one-dimensional, and I can see why it's beloved as one of the best games in the genre. Now, I don't have that much experience in this game, but I hear that it's very important to find an item that can mitigate a survivor's weak point, since getting a double jump is pretty much a must for the end game. Plus, there are item stands that lets you choose between three different items, as well as scrap stations that can manipulate your build. However, like I said, there seems to be a huge discrepancy between rare and common items. If you get a legendary or a lunar item, you're pretty much guaranteed to make it further into the run. They're just that powerful. At least according to my Discord server, which everybody knows that along with Reddit has the most reliable information on anything video game related. With that, I give Risk of Rain 2 a luck rating of 7 and a skill rating of 5. Hades is a isometric hack and slash roguelike where you try to escape hell, and it's a pretty straightforward game. 
Now this is one of the recent roguelikes that I noticed that it handles difficulty very well. As you improve as a player, you also get better upgrades. I never really had any problems when it came to Hades. Once you reach a certain point at around, I don't know, 10 to 20 hours, you eventually beat the game. I actually think Hades contains less skill than some of the other games on this list. If this video contained a story rating, then Hades would be at a 10. I think it does something really unique among other roguelikes. Now, my ratings don't factor in story elements, but this is something that I think people should be aware of. The room layouts are pretty much set, more or less, and there are ways to manipulate your boons, which are the upgrades. It's actually not too difficult to fish for the specific upgrades you're looking for. For example, if you get poor quality boons, you can always try to get the Demeter keepsake and fish for a rare crop, which upgrades the rarity of your other boons. With how accessible everything is, there's a reason why it got extremely high praise last year when it came out. Even after beating the game for the first time, there is the Pact of Punishment, which is a way to test your skills at the game, and it's also pretty straightforward. Now, I realized you can technically break the game and max out the heat gauge to make the game borderline impossible to beat, but there's no incentive to go past 20 heat. Since 20 heat is the last level of heat before you stop getting bounties, there's really no reason to go past 20, unless you purposely want to challenge yourself. If you put it that way, I don't think Hades is as hard as some of the other games on this list, but the story and the atmosphere and the music was very much enjoyable. I give Hades a luck rating of 2 and a skill rating of 6. Nuclear Throne is a very classic arcade-type twin-stick shooter. The mechanics are quite simple, and there's really not any explanations you need to know before embarking on a run. I should say that this game is very hard. Although a typical run only lasts around 10 minutes, assuming that you win, you can die really easily. In fact, explosions just straight up one-shots you. There are a lot of colorful characters that you can play as, each with their own perks, and five categories of weapons you can find in the run. Now, what's weird is that within the community, there is no objectively best build or character. And I think this is how Nuclear Throne benefits from being a very simple game. Some people think Crystal's shield ability is overpowered, but I prefer a more offensive playstyle. Some think the roll ability for Fish is useless, but for me, Fish is my favorite character in the game. Some think Recycle Gland sucks in the late game. Meanwhile, my longest loops always contain Recycle Gland. Some players can loop endlessly with explosive weapons, while I personally can't stand them. In the community, no one can agree on anything, and for me, that's a good thing. It just means that every strategy is viable. To put it into perspective, Nuclear Throne, in my opinion, is one of the most skill-oriented games in the genre and there's really no end on how much you can improve, even after a couple hundred hours of playtime. And with that, I give Nuclear Throne a luck rating of 1 and a skill rating of 10. One Step From Eden is more of a personal pick. It's definitely not as popular as some of the other games. I could have picked Noida or Crypt of the Necrodancer, but I don't have nearly as many hours in those games than I do this one. And there's something about One Step From Eden that really stuck out to me. Similarly to, say, the Spire, you build a deck of cards that you can use in combat. However, you can move around these different tiles while managing your deck, and you win by using your cards in a way that best suits your strategy. Maybe by lining up a row of fire, or by placing down a turret and moving them up or down to set its sights on the enemy. Given that it's a smaller game, there were some balancing issues that I found, and I also figured that some builds were just strictly better than others. When things get too hectic, you really don't have the time to think about what order you play your cards in. You're just gonna mash buttons and hope for the best. Now, how this game differs from Slay the Spire is that there is mechanical gameplay. If you have a background in Toho Project and you're a god at bullet hell, you can't technically beat the game with only the starting deck. With so many categories of spells available, there's almost no end to synergies you can have. Being that it's a pretty underrated game, I definitely recommend people to try it out. I give One Step From Eden a luck rating of 5, and a skill rating of 7. Ah, Dead Cells, my bread and butter. This game is known to be very difficult, but I don't think it's the hardest game on this list. What differentiates Dead Cells with some other roguelikes is that there's no tier system when it comes to weapons and skills. 
all items have equal chances of appearing, and that is one of the primary reasons I find it to be such a joy to play. You can form synergies in any combination of items and think of ways to play the game that no one has thought of before. Now difficulty in Dead Cells is handled via the boss cell system. Although each level of boss cell makes the game harder, it also unlocks more content. All the way up until 5 BC, where there is literally an additional biome as well as a boss fight at the end of the game. So there's always a meaningful reason to improve. Now since 5 BC is the only way to obtain the final ending, it is intended by the developers that you improve enough to get to this point. And honestly, it's one of the best games to give you motivation to keep improving. If you want reasons why this game is so great, just look at my channel. And with that, I give Dead Cells a luck rating of 3 and a skill rating of 8. So finally, here is my list. Feel free to give any insights of your own or recommend any roguelikes you think are worth trying out. Obviously, I had to rethink my ratings quite a bit since I couldn't give the same ratings to two different games, but I thought this is a fair comparison and I had a lot of fun putting this together. Again, feel free to put your own list in the comments. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all next time.